everybody. I hope everyone's having a wonderful day. So I'm just going to be picking up from where I was last time, and I was talking about some graph theoretic terminology. So I'm just going to knock a couple more terms out here, and then we're going to talk about something a little different. So I want to talk about what a subgraph is. So a subgraph is just a subset of the vertices and edges such that it forms another graph, H. And so what do I mean by that? So I have this gra overall graph here that I outlined in black. This is called the Peterson graph, by the way. It's just a, it's an interesting graph. Um, but a subgraph of G would be H here. So it would be these five vertices and the edges that are connected between these five here. So note that technically the subgraph could be without this edge here in red. That is perfectly valid. However, I cannot just have an edge just sitting out here without that vertex. Does everybody see that? So it's very important that it forms another graph. We clearly cannot have a graph where there's just an edge sitting out here because there's no vertex, right? So that's a subgraph. A connected component of a graph is a maximally connected subgraph. So what does maximally connected mean? So you've got to think about it like this. So here's a graph here. Now, imagine if I told you, okay, well, say if I took this edge with these two endpoints, that's a subgraph of this graph, correct? Now, a maximally connected subgraph means, so first that one edge was connected, right? However, there's another edge here that's, that's incident on this vertex. So that means that this edge should be a part of my subgraph, but that connects to another vertex, right? So by maximally, it means that there cannot be any way to add another edge or vertex into this so-called chunk, which we'll call a connected component, uh, without violating the property that it's connected, right? So I'm just going to keep, I, I, if there is an edge and a vertex I can reach, I'm going to assume that it is maximal in terms of its size, okay? So when you look at this graph here, how many connected components are there then? So I'm looking for maximally connected subgraph. So if I look at, say, this one right here, okay, is this maximally connected? No, it's not big. It, there's more incident edges on it, right? So it means I can keep going, right? Can I find any more vertices uh, from this, from these vertices? No. So we call this a connected component. So how many connected components are there in this graph? There are three. This one, this one, and this one. So a natural question I have is, how many connected components are there in a connected graph? Just one, right? Just one. So I'll let you think about that if you don't, if it doesn't spark out at you right away. So that being said, we're going to shift gears ever so slightly. We're still talking about graphs. We're going to talk about representations of graphs. So naturally, I've shown you all these nice structures involving graphs and all these properties. How can we actually represent these from a data structure standpoint? Now, you notice I didn't give you an ADT. It's, I find that very often an ADT can be so broad with a graph that I'm just going to avoid doing that here. You can talk about generally about insertions, removals of edges and vertices. In a graph, you can also talk about getting all the incident edges of a given vertex. You also might want to know if two vertices are adjacent to one another or not. Uh, some of these I'll talk about here, others I'll let you look at in the notes, so please do take a look at those. So the first one I want to talk about is a classic called an adjacency matrix. So in an adjacency matrix, you have a two-dimensional array where each element is going to be it's going to tell you whether the vertex i and the vertex j are adjacent or not. So i and j are the position. So I'm going to assume that each one of the elements in this array can be indexed into by the vertex. So I'm assuming there's some mapping between the labels of the vertices and numbers from 0 to n minus 1. So, so this two-dimensional array is n by n. Now, I should mention that during, so in this discussion, I'm going to also mention things about a general scheme for a couple ways of representing these graphs. 
I'm going to focus mostly on the classic representation. However, be aware that there are more general ways you can adapt these representations. I'm just showing you a couple. I'm going to present you the generalized scheme, and then I'll also will give you kind of this classic approach. These are the ones I'm going to interpret these as, okay? So, classically, the zero one, it's a zero one matrix where one is present in that, in that element. If the edge is existent in the graph, zero otherwise. So here's what the classic interpretation. So imagine I have this graph here. Now, if I look at each one of these, I'm going to index each one of these vertices by their subscripts. So this would be zero, this is one, that's two, that's three, that's four. Gotcha? So now, all I'm going to say is, okay, well, if I want to know that V0 and V4 are adjacent or not, what I do is I go into the matrix, and I look at, and uh, I can look at row zero and column four, and I see there's a one there. That means that they're adjacent. If that were zero there, that would mean there's no edge from zero to four. So there would be no edge right there. So likewise, you could do the same thing with the columns and the rows, uh, at least in an undirected graph. Now, uh, there's one interesting fact I want to point out is that the diagonal here does not consist of any ones in a simple graph because there's no self loops, right? Uh, as we'll see, the diagonal, if you look at the diagonal, uh, one neat property of the diagonal is that if you look at this side, the upper triangle of the matrix, it's going to be exactly the same if I reflected it down like a folding of a piece of paper in an undirected graph. This is not true in a directed graph though. So, I just want to point that out. So just think of it as just a matrix. Each one of the elements will say, hey, look, I'm, in, I'm adjacent to you or I'm not adjacent to you. Now, the more generalized scheme for an adjacency matrix, if you're wondering, is we would replace the zeros with null references. And then wherever there's a one, what you would do is you would put a reference to an edge object you would contain in an edge list. So you'd have a list, uh, some, some data structure that's storing all your lists and all your vertices. And what this would do is this would be a reference to that edge object so you can access it and get its properties. So here, we're just going to assume if we ever need some additional data, what we'll do is we'll augment the structure a little bit. This is pretty common. So let's talk about some properties adjacent, uh, adjacency matrix has. So the first thing, while I'm erasing this, I want you to think about how much space does this matrix occupy? Think about it in terms of the number of vertices. So how much space am I using with this adjacency matrix? How much does it use? It uses how much? Big O of n squared space, at least, right? So that being said, how do you know that? Well, I have an n by n matrix, right? Quite natural. So this is the structure in hand, okay? So what about uh, if I wanted to know if two vertices are adjacent to one another? If I want to determine if two vertices are adjacent to one another, how long does that take? How long does that take? Well, it should take big O of 1, right? If I can index directly into this matrix, all I have to do is just look in the entry just like I did before. So this should take big O of 1 time. When I say that, I mean you can get the end, and so you can get the adjacency or not. Um, you can get that information in constant time because it's, it's just like accessing an array, right? It's just a two-dimensional array. The whole point is that you have some way of indexing into this matrix by the vertices. Normally, I'll assume that these vertices are labeled, okay? So I can label them by some number. However, you can very easily see how you can map this on a more general structure like the lookup table where you have your vertices, then you have a, an associated number that's with that vertex. So you just have a little lookup table or hash table. So how about... Uh, how about if you did insertions or deletions on this thing? If I do an insertion or a deletion, 
If I want to remove an edge from this graph, how fast can I do that? So an edge, if I want to insert an edge, if the vertices already exist, well, how easy is it? If I want to remove this edge, all I have to do is set that to zero and set this to zero, right? So how long does that take? It takes constant time. Very fast. How about the vertices, though? Say if I, if I have a vertex I want to remove or I want a vertex to add, how long is that going to take? Well, this is a two-dimensional array, so I might have to delete a whole column or a row or add another column in a row, but I might run out of space, so I either have to do some shifting around or something like that, but this takes quadratic time, right? That's particularly uh, not the greatest. It's okay when the, the matrix is not terribly big. But when if it's really big, that's going to be pretty time consuming. So let's talk a little bit about when you might want to use something like this. So, so a major drawback of an adjacency matrix is that, that if a graph is sparse, so usually when I use the word sparse, I usually mean that uh, uh, M is big O of N, so it's just something kind of close to the number of vertices, but it could be some any constant factor away. The adjacency matrix A is going to have a lot of zeros in it. Lots of zero entries. Which, of course, this is redundant. You have a whole bunch of zeros in this. This whole structure is just... I've encoded the entire graph using this matrix, but most of it's redundant because it's not, there's not too many adjacencies occurring, right? So, this is one drawback of this. What would this... You could twist this around and say, hey, look, that's a pessimistic way of looking at this. An optimistic way is to simply say, hey, look, when the graph is dense, If G is dense, usually this is close to big O of N squared. It's great, right? You're not, you're not, you're, you're using this to its full potential. So if it is what is called dense, then this adjacency matrix representation is ideal. But it's, in practice, this is particularly useful when the matrices aren't too terribly big, but there are ways to get around that, but I'm not going to have time to talk about that here. So if it's dense, this is an ideal choice of representing the graph. So that brings me to dealing with this drawback. Is there any way I can deal with this issue where if, if the vertices and whatnot, if there aren't too many edges, like it isn't super packed up nicely, what can I do with that? That brings me to the other type of representation. It's called an adjacency list. So an adjacency list, you've got to look at it as an incident sequence for each vertex, where there is a collection of incident edges for some given vertex. So what do I mean by that? I'm going to refer you to this middle picture here, this picture I drew here in advance. So this is a generalized scheme for an adjacency list. So there's all sorts of things you can look at when you infer from this. So you have a primary structure that is some, some structure that is going to consist of all of your vertices. So this will typically be a list, might be a table. Uh, the point is, is that it depends on if you want access to these really fast. Usually we want that, right? And then each one of the vert vertex objects has access to a list or some collection of the edges. So these would be the edge objects. So this is a generalized scheme. What we're going to look at is the cla a classic implementation of such a adjacency list. So this is if you ever talk to somebody about an adjacency list, they're more likely to point this at you. So the classic way of doing things is that you have a, an array for which each one of the elements is a is a link list. So you remember, just like I had before, I'm going to assume each one of the vertices is numbered from 0 to n minus 1. And what happens is, 
I'm going to put in each one of the nodes in my linked list the other endpoint of the edge or any relevant data. For example, this might be a reference to an edge object or this might be just some other piece of information. The point is, is that point, the point is, is that if you look at, say, for example, my same graph, this is the same graph I had before. You'll notice if I look at vertex zero, it's adjacent to vertex four. That means that there's an edge A here and its other endpoints, so if I go from vertex zero, one of its adjacent vertices is four. This is the same as for all these other ones. Does everybody see that? So this is quite nice if you're thinking about more of a sparse representation of a graph, and this deals with that drawback. Now, I want to talk a little bit about properties. So let's talk about first, uh, the, let's talk about adjacencies. So let's talk about, this works, say, oops, kicking stuff. So let's talk about how I determine if, it, if, if uh, two vertices are adjacent. So if I want to determine if there's an edge in the graph, the two endpoints, how do I do that? Well, what I do is I, I, I check, okay, I have, I have U and V, what, or I and J. What do I do? Well, I put I into my index here. So I index into this array using the first of the two numbers. And then what I do is I search across the linked list for the other endpoint. So how long does that take? Now, if you're first looking at this and saying, well, Dan, that list could be really long, right? <laughs> It's very possible that that list could maybe, maybe consist of all the edges, which in that case, technically you're correct. But there's a better way we can do things here. Remember, we actually had a concept for this. Remember, these are the number of edges. You can look at this in terms of the number of edges each one of the vertices are incident on. So notice that I only have one edge here that's incident on zero. How about four? There's two, right? Two edges are incident on four. So what, how long does that take then? So to check if u v, uh, u v is in the graph, it should take what? Well, we had a definition for this. This is the number of incident edges of that vertex, or either one, which this should be the minimum. Um, yeah, let's go with the minimum. It's the minimum of the degree of u and the degree of v. Now, you might ask, why am I taking both of them? Well, remember, I'm if you talk about an undirected graph, I can go down either one of these lists. So I can take, for example, if I was thinking about, if I want to determine four is adjacent to zero, I can go down four and find zero here, or I can go down zero and go find four. However, in a digraph, that may not necessarily be the case. The adjacency is only one directional. So it's very possible you might need to, if you give me this, you just need to index down one of the lists, but I'm just going to account for both, just in case you need to go down either one. So you can just select one of the two lists and then you just traverse down it. If you find it, you're good. But ideally you would index into using U and then you would find V, okay? So either way, it's the degree of U. But I just want to be very charitable here. So really it's just this, but in case you have a more complex graph structure, I'm going to include that in there. So if somebody asked you, for undirected graphs, is that. Okay. So, uh, how about, so that being said, how about the space usage? How much space are we going to use? Well, how, how big is this array? This array has n elements in it. So, we have, what do we have? We have a list for each vertex. Uh, 
a list for each vertex. So n lists, we're going to have n lists. Each one might have some constant amount of space that might be allocated with them. The pointer, for example, a reference to the list. And each list for vertex V has how many? How many nodes does it have? It has the degree of V nodes, right? So how much space am I using? Well, it's going to be N, so it'll be something that looks like N plus, plus the sum of all, over all the vertices, the degree of V, but remember, this is the we can use the handshaking lemma here. So, like I said, it's going to come up every once in a while. What is this? This is two times m. So it's big O of m plus n. So it's linear in the space usage it has. So unlike the the adjacency matrix where you, you, you basically are, it's all on the demand of the vertices. Now it's on the edges and the vertices, but it's linear in the number, the size of the graph. So I'll let you look in the notes for some of the more operations. I wanted to point out one other thing. Now you might actually ask, I, okay, I talked about a dense graph versus a sparse graph. Why would I care about sparse graphs? Um, believe it or not, sparse graphs occur quite often. Um, so I'm just going to say notice, notice that if M is big O of N, what happens if M is big O of N? This be, the space usage is big O of N, which is quite nice. And now if you think about this, these lookup times, now they're not going to be relative to the number of edges. Now they're in terms of the number of vertices, right? So when I... For example, if I had to go through this entire structure, cleaning up anything on a removal, now it's going to be in terms of the number of vertices, not the not because the edges and the vertices are now related quite closely. So notice that if m is big O of n, the above is quite efficient. It's supposed to say efficient, by the way. So, so you might ask, okay, well, what kind of graphs are sparse or at least, like look sparse? So sparse graphs include, and now you've seen some oh, actually already. Uh, for example, trees have this property. Remember, we proved that n is equal to m my sorry, m is equal to n minus one. So that would definitely be big O of n. How about a forest? Forests definitely fall into this. Now I'm going to give you one more. Now there's other ones as well, but one that I'm going to talk about is a plate is are called planar graphs. So let me just show you what a planar graph is, and you might naturally say, hey, look, that's actually kind of interesting. So the third one I'm going to mention here is called the planar graph. So let me define what a planar graph is. So, so what is a planar graph? Now, just to motivate this, I'm just going to draw a picture. So if I give you a give you the complete graph on four vertices, I gave you one picture earlier. But would you agree with me that this is K4? So this is the complete graph on four vertices. Because every vertex is adjacent to every other vertex. This is K4. Now, I have a question for you. Is there any way... So you'll notice that the edges that I have, and keep in mind, they don't have to be straight like this. They can be, they can be curves and things like that. Is there any way I can draw this without so that there isn't this crossing right here? Is there any way I can draw this graph on a flat piece of paper 
so-called the plane, such that there's no crossing here? The answer is, of course, yes. What I can do is I can kind of shuffle things around by pushing, push this vertex into here, and then I can get the one I had before. So the one I showed you last class for K4. So this is why I say that the, the structure of the graph really is what matters most, but depends on the context. So notice that this is also K4. All I've done is I've just moved this into here. So I've just pushed it, like imagine all the edges moving with it, into right here. So this graph would be something I, so K4 is an example of a planar graph. So what's a planar graph? It is a graph. A graph where there exists a way to embed or draw uh, embed or draw it in the plane. such that its edges only cross at their endpoints. So if I give you any graph, and keep in mind, it only just has to be that there exists a way you can embed it. If you draw me the graph, like this right here, isn't an planar drawing of K4. However, I know it's planar because that drawing exists. Now, many, many, many types of graphs you may encounter in the real world are actually planar graphs. You can think of several examples. Geographic maps, where you don't have to, so I'm making certain assumptions, such as that you can, you don't have to worry about things stacking on top of each other. Uh, you may not necessarily have it where it's planar, but many things that are kind of geographical and you can lay them out in terms of straight lines or curves onto a plane, they are planar. So naturally, if you think about this, many graphs you may encounter in practice are actually planar graphs. That's what makes them interesting. But not all graphs are planar. For example, uh, for example, if I just go up one higher in terms of the complete graphs, I'm going to summon something, I swear, at this point. Um, if I consider K5, so this is K5. Is K5 planar? I'll let you think about that. There's a very interesting resulting graph theory that tells you no. So that concludes my main discussion on graphs. Now what we're going to do is now we're going to pick up all the stuff we've been doing with graphs and start talking about some algorithms. Next topic, we're going to talk about graph traversal. So what exactly is a graph traversal? Very, put very simply, it is a process of starting at a vertex. Starting at a vertex, U in V, which I'll oftentimes write, as you've probably seen, in set theoretic notation as U in V, where this is symbol meaning in. Um, uh, starting at a vertex, U in V, and processing all its vertices and edges reachable from you. So what do I mean by reachable from you? So what we're going to do is we're going to perform a traversal. So it means we're going to explore the graph. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to reach as far as possible as we can in the graph, starting at some vertex, okay? So let me just draw out a graph that just to illustrate this point.
Okay, so here's a graph here. Um, I'm going to make u be a. So I'm going to start off my traversal at a. And I want to know if I were to explore from a, if I which vertices and edges are reachable from this point here. So you would agree with me, with that, earlier we talked about the notion of connected, right? Where I tried to create a maximally connected subgraph. This is going to be closely related to this. So you'd agree with me that I can reach any one of these vertices by going over edges, right? So you'd agree with me that all the vertices in this graph are reachable from u. How about if I added another one here? Call it h. Is h reachable from u, from uh, from a? Is there any way I can reach h from u over there? No. So, so these would be the set. These would be the vertices and edges I can reach from u. So we call these vertices reachable from u. This one is not reachable from u. So there's going to be some assumptions I'm going to make in this lecture. First, I'm going to assume that you can access the vertices and mark and demark them. So what do I mean by this? I can take one of these vertices, I can mark it, or I'll put usually a little X beside it, marking it to say I've already visited it. Or I can take away the X and say I am demarking it. So removing the mark. So I'm going to assume I can do this in big O of one time or constant time. And I'm going to assume that edges can be labeled or the label can be removed. So a label might say something, like it's explore or it has some special name. So I'm going to assume that takes constant time. So two natural ways you can represent this is one, you can have an associated array of vertex, vertex objects and edges. And each one has a property for which it has a label or it can be marked or not marked. And I have direct access to it. So in some way in my data structure, I'll have some way of accessing that object so that I can use it. Okay. So either I have some list or it's built directly into my representation, like the adjacency list. I might keep some piece of information along with each one of the endpoints. So each one of the vertices, I might include that marking or unmarking. If it's an edge, I might include that incident edges information. Okay. I'm just assuming that there's some way I can access these in cost of time, which is indeed possible. So I'll let you think about that. I have more details about that in the notes. So I'm going to first talk about one of the more standard ways you can, you can traverse through a graph. First one is called depth first search, which I will lovingly abbreviate as DFS. So the way I want you to think about DFS is very often, I like to use this analogy. So I want you to think of the graph like a maze. Where, where the vertices are intersections, are intersections, so they crisscross and dead ends. And edges are passages. So the passages connect the intersections. So that being said, this is what we're going to do. We want to imagine this graph as a maze that I want to navigate and explore. So the way I like to explain this is using the myth of Theseus and the Minotaur. Now you may or may not know this story. I'll give you kind of the the very, very simplified version of it. In the notes, I give you a link to, if you were curious about learning a bit more about it. Uh, so what we're going to be interested in is we're going to be interested in imagining this maze as a labyrinth. So this great and complex maze that was developed by the great inventor Daedalus in the myths, where what happened was 
is King Minos pissed off a Greek god named Poseidon. And what happened was, uh, Poseidon thought it was a great idea to take King Minos' wife and do something to his wife to make her fall in love with a bull. Now, the fun thing about this is that, now, and oftentimes if you read this in a children's book, they do not go into the fine details of what happens next. But I assure you, the actual, if you go break this thing down, it goes into fine details. Let's just say Daedalus built quite a structure for King Minos' wife to climb into to have do something with this bull. I'm not going to go into those details, okay? The point is, is that King Minos' wife and the bull, they did this. And they created the Minotaur, okay? Or the Minotaur. So what happened? Well, King Minos was ashamed of this whole thing involving Poseidon and the shame that came with this. And at the same time, there was this occurring conflict over with Athens, which King Minos is, by the way, the king of Crete. What happened was, okay, well, King Minos was expecting so-called sacrifices of so-called numbers of brave women and men. So that as offerings for what Athens did to Crete, okay? So what happened was, is King Minos would then send these people into the labyrinth. And the Minotaur would be there and would eat them, okay? You would never see these people ever again. So Theseus, so I'm just going to kind of speed you up in the story. Theseus would enter the labyrinth after getting advice from King Minos' daughter, Eradne. And what would happen was, this is the advice that Eridanae gave her, gave him. I'm getting excited here. Is Eridanae gave Theseus a, a, a long, long roll or spool of string. And the idea was that Theseus would attach or put the string at the starting point for which Theseus entered the labyrinth. Because this labyrinth is deeply complicated, okay? It's so complicated, people just don't know how to escape it. Maybe it's not this particular labyrinth, but it's some really complicated one. So the way Theseus would navigate through the maze is start here and roll out this as Theseus would explore the labyrinth. So if Theseus hits a dead end, what's Theseus going to do? Roll back up the string and then try going down a different route until Theseus potentially marks down all the locations in the maze, okay? So as Theseus is exploring, Theseus will put marks on the wall. Now, I don't know if he actually does that in the story, but we're going to assume that, that Theseus would put marks on the, in the passages and the walls or dead ends or intersections, okay? So that's how we're going to approach Depth First Search. And that's basically what Depth First Search is about. So imagine Theseus is entering the labyrinth, and Theseus' job is to map out the labyrinth and find the Minotaur, and slay the Minotaur. So how is this exactly going to work? So, so imagine I have here a string. So imagine I have my string, and imagine I start here. Now, Obviously, I've already visited A, so I'm just going to put a mark on the ground and say, hey, look, I've already visited here. Maybe Theseus goes down this way. What, what should Theseus do? Mark down? Mark, well, should, should Theseus mark this first, or should Theseus mark something here? Probably should mark something here, right? So Theseus, Theseus marks this passage, then goes here. Theseus then marks this dead end and then tries to look around and see if there's any other passages. What does Theseus do? Well, there's nothing else, so I'm going to roll back up my string and go back over to A and explore down this way. Now, before that, I better mark down this, this passage, and then I'm going to, when I arrive here, I'm going to mark this, this uh, intersection, and now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to keep exploring, right? Now, the way I want you to imagine is this string is actually really representing our call stack. So when I started off, 
I started off with A, and then I went to H, but did I find anything at H? No, so H is no more, so I went to B. Okay, so now I'm at B. What do I do here? Well, I find a passage, I mark it, and so I label this edge. Now I'm gonna assume that these black labels, they represent I've discovered it. So I'm gonna call these discovery edges because Theseus discovered them that very first time. So Theseus discovers C, marks C, and then checks if there's any that have not been labeled yet. There's one right here. So Theseus labels that, and then goes to D, marks D, looks for another one. Okay, well, labels, labels this edge here, finds E, marks E. Now, which way should Theseus go? Let's make these just go down this way. I, I feel like that might be a good idea. Now keep in mind, I have no control over which the, which way Theseus goes. I don't have, I, I can't control Theseus' brain, okay? Um, Theseus goes through a lot in this story, by the way. I'm not going to go into much detail on that. So I mark, same idea, I mark. Now, I have, I have an edge already here. But notice that I already, I already went down this intersection. So what Theseus is going to do instead is instead of marking with an X or la sorry labeling it as a discovery edge, he's going to label it as a so-called back edge. So Theseus marks this as a back edge, and now because I guess I should be keeping this up to date. So I have C D E F sort of running out of space, F and G here. So what's going to happen? Okay, well now G has checked all the edges. I'm, now keep in mind, I'm not going to go down this route, right? I already know that what's here. I already went there. So I'm going to start rolling back up my string and going backwards to F. Now F, are there any passages I haven't yet labeled yet? Now, so I'm going to go back, I'm going to unroll, I'm going to keep rolling out my string. And now, okay, well E, are there any edges? There's this one right here. But I already can see that it goes to B, right? So I'm going to label that as a back edge. And hey, look, now I'm done. There's no other passages. I've already explored E. Then I go to D, nothing. C, nothing. B, nothing. A, nothing. And I'm done. Do you see I've labeled every one of the edges in all the vertices? I've marked every vertex, labeled every edge. So these black ones, these are called discovery edges. So we'll call these discovery edges. And these pinkish purplish ones, these are the back edges. These different kinds of edges have special properties that we're going to talk about in the next couple lectures. So let me write out what DFS is. So I'm going to assume that DFS is assumed to give you some vertex as input, and it's going to traverse through and try to get all the edges and vertices reachable from you. So let me write down DFS. So algorithm, DFS. So we're going to assume DFS takes in a vertex U, vertex U and V, and I'm going to just assume that the graph is connected at this stage, but you'll see that it doesn't really matter a whole lot. So its output is going to be a DFS traversal. Of G starting at U. So, what are we going to do? Remember what I did every single time. What did Theseus do the first time Theseus entered an intersection? It marked it. So, I'm going to mark U, and then I look across all my possible ways I could go, right? For every, for every, every edge. And now, 
u comma v. So I'm going to look at all the in edges incident on v. I'm going to do the following. So if if the edge u v is not labeled, because obviously we don't really care about the ones that are labeled, right? They're already done with. We already went there. So if, now I care about if I've already visited an intersection of my labyrinth. So if V is marked, what should I do? What did I do when I marked, when there was a vertex already marked? Then, what do we do? We're going to label UV as back edge. It means it, it's not going to take us anywhere new, okay? So we're going to label as a back edge. Otherwise, we're going to do the following. I'm going to label UV as discovery edge. And then I'm going to call recursively DFS on V, so the other endpoint. So let me make sure I got all these lined up. And that is DFS. Isn't that neat? So what we're going to do now is I'm going to analyze DFS. So I'm not going to prove the correctness of DFS. You're just going to take my word for it. It's not very hard to see from what I've written here. I don't like these as an excuse, but you only have so much time here, okay? So let's do the analysis here. So marking the vertex. This takes how much time? It's some constant, right? It takes some, actually let me use a different marker. So this takes constant C1 time. Okay, how long does all of this take? If I remember, I'm going to ignore the recursion. So I'm going to treat this like it takes a single step. How long does everything inside of here take? It takes constant time. So it's going to take some constant number of operations. How about this? Well, I don't really know. It actually kind of depends on the graph representation. So I'm just going to label this as the number of iterations times uh, times C2. So how long this takes is the number of iterations times C2. So what is this all going to be together then? Let's talk about the time complexity. Time complexity. So I'm going to represent it and I'm going to check this for an adjacency matrix, then the adjacency list, okay? So first we ignore uh, the recursive call. So I already laid out everything here. For the sake of time, I'm going to say that uh, I'm going to come back to the recursion here. So here you would write out all of this, what I just said in words. Uh, then, then we consider the recursion here. Thus, the total number number of, of operations at some vertex, because you would agree with me that this is, ver this is applied to one vertex. I mean, I have to apply this to multiple vertices. At some vertex, uh, vertex, uh, u is c1 plus c2 times uh, number of iterations. So I'm just counting up all these operations and I'm being, I'm just being careful here. So now this is where the recursive calls come into play. So I just want to observe that the algorithm, that the algorithm visits, visits every vertex in G exactly once. Thus, the 
The total number of calls is what? Is the number of vertices, right? So the time complexity So the time complexity is the following. It is the sum of u in v of c1 plus c2 times the number of iterations. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this with different implementations so or different representations. So first, we're going to look at it with the adjacency matrix in mind. Normally when you're doing this in practice, you would pick the one that makes the most sense. I'm just going to do them both because I'm going to give you a bunch of different variants of this algorithm. And they're all going to have the same type of analysis I'm laying out here. So to consider, consider each edge uv incident on u. How do, you, how do you check all the incident edges in an adjacency matrix? You look at the row, right? You go through the whole row. We, uh, we must, in the worst case, traverse a whole row of the adjacency matrix. Of the adjacency matrix. So uh, the number of iterations equals n. Actually, let's make it less than or equal to n. Either way, you'll be perfectly fine. So, what does that mean? So I'm just going to plug in what I have here. Therefore, therefore, the time complexity, the time complexity, this says time complexity, is the sum of all the vertices, u and v, of C1 plus C2 times N, which is, of course, if I just look at this, okay, well, there's N vertices, right? So I'm going to end up with C1 times N plus C2 times N squared. What is that? That This is big O what? It's N squared, right? So using DFS on a vertex, it's just going to be big O of n squared for an adjacency matrix. Okay, let's look at an adjacency list, and that's going to be the end for today. So let me just quickly do the adjacency matrix. Uh, sorry, the adjacency list. You'll see that the analysis plays out quite quickly. Okay, so let's bang this out. So. How do we deter how long does it take for me to get all the incident edges? So to get all edges incident on you takes how long? It takes scanning the degree of you uh, nodes of of the list of u, right? So how many iterations must it be that is based on the degree of u? Therefore, the worst case time complexity 
is the following. It is, it is the sum. So remember, u and v, c1 plus the degree of u times c2. What is this? Well, that's just c1 times n plus the sum. So the c2 times, if I do this all over all the vertices, it's the sum of the degrees. What is that, guys? It is, by the handshake limit, that's 2 times m, right? So the c1m plus c2 times n plus, sorry, it's 2 times m. But what is this? What is this? This is big O of m plus n. So it takes linear time in the representation of my adjacency list, which is quite nice. So I gave you these two types of analyses. Now I want you to look at the notes uh, for one additional detail, but I'll just kind of summarize it quickly here. So how can we make sure, so you notice that in DFS, I determined the one, the, the vertices and edges that are reachable from a, a, a vertex U, right? Or uh, so what, what we naturally would like to do is sometimes be able to do this over the entire graph. Do you see how you might be able to do that? Well, it's quite simple. You just use a loop to go through all of the vertices. You just go through each vertex in the graph. You check, is it marked? If it isn't marked, then you better run DFS on that vertex. The great thing is, if you actually think about this a little carefully, this actually doesn't change the time complexities at all in these analyses. So it doesn't really matter that I'm starting at one vertex. You can augment this so that it's DFS given a graph and you just simply scan through the vertices and you, if you only apply DFS or algorithm here, if the vertex is not marked. How do you know that this isn't introducing a whole bunch of extra work? Well, remember, I, only, I do explore the entire connected component. So if I apply DFS to another vertex after the fact, that means that the graph wasn't connected. That means that all the things I do call on that vertex now are completely irrelevant to the other part of the graph. And thus, this won't really change anything happening here. There's no overlapping work going on here. The point is, is that it doubles as two things. One, you can run DFS on the entire graph by just simply resetting our algorithm by scanning through all the vertices and just check if they're, if they're, if they're not marked, then you better run DFS on it. The time complexities don't change um, because there's no overlapping work going on here. Furthermore, you can design a very easy algorithm for testing if a graph is connected or not. Do you see how you can do it? You just simply just check if all the vertices are marked, right? You can either keep a count of how many you've, you've marked, or you can just check all of them, okay? So we're gonna stop right here, and when we come back, we'll talk about how we can use DFS to solve other problems, and we'll move on to talk about another type of graph traversal. So I wanna say thank you very much, and have yourself a beautiful day.